Good morning. And uh, welcome to our service this morning. And good morning to those who are watching us online or who, who will watch us later in the week. Uh, there are a couple of announcements. Uh, first one is we welcome back Pastor Kim Richardson, who will be uh, giving the message today. Uh, and uh, I assume that that is your wife sitting next to you. Okay. <laughs> We welcome you too. <laughs> um, Tim is on vacation. Uh, we'll be back next week. Do we have any COVID update on him? No. Last we heard, he was uh, he was positive. Jen was positive, but Alex was negative. So Alex Alex is going back to school Monday. Back Pardon? He went back Friday. Oh, he went back on Friday. All right, he's already back to school. Good. Uh, which means they're all on the mend. So, I mean, it's not a serious case of the, uh, of the disease. Uh, for those who were not here last week, uh, we began our praying our way to Pentecost last week. There are still some uh, booklets on the table in the back. So if you haven't had a chance to pick one up or have it pushed to your phone, which is very convenient, I get up in the morning, first thing I do is take a look at that and uh, go through the, the prayer and the little uh, meditation they have, uh, and then take Ralph to the state park. So uh, very easy. Uh, I've been, uh, you know, it's, it's great. We're trying to have a half million people in North America. Actually, ideally, you'd have all the Nazarene associated people in uh, North America praying uh, from now until uh, Pentecost. Um, let's see, anything else? Oh, oh, didn't want to miss this. Uh, ordination service is Friday, May 13th. That's open. Uh, you don't need to wear a mask. You don't need to social distance. So if you want to do that, it's over at the South Portland Church. And then the district assembly meeting is also, is the next day, Saturday, May 14th, uh, beginning at 9 o'clock. That's open as well, uh, if you'd like to attend that. Are there any other, uh, are there any other announcements that we should be aware of? Let's continue with our worship this morning. Our call to worship this morning is from Isaiah 55. Come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. You who have no money, come, buy, and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen. Listen to me and eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest of fare. Now you're welcome to stand with us as we worship God, for he is worthy.
Father and our God, we thank you for the privilege of being here this morning. We pray, Lord, in fact, that our time of worship together would help us to focus fully on you and to make you the center of our lives, the center of every decision, the center of every action, the uh, center of all that we do, Lord. We pray, God, that as we gather here, uh, to worship you. We would be open to whatever you want to say to us. We would be open uh, to how you want to minister among us as a community and how you want to speak into our individual hearts. So we thank you for this privilege. We give, you our, we give ourselves to this time and Lord we know that you're here. So we just pray that your spirit would truly oversee all that happens this morning and we pray this in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Well, at this time, if you would like to worship through giving your tithes and your offerings to the Lord, you may do that by coming forward and placing your offering here in the plates. So you can give online, you can give through Easy Tithe app, and you can give through texting. So however the Lord leads you to give, we encourage you to do so.
seated and receive the food of his holy word today. This morning's first lesson is Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 7 through 11. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, O oh, wicked man, you will surely die, and you do not speak out to dissuade him from his way, the wicked man will die for his sin, and I will hold you accountable for his blood. But if you do warn the wicked man to turn from his way, and he does not do so, he will die for his sin, but you will have saved yourself. Son of man, say to the house of Israel, this is what you are saying, our offenses and sins weigh us down and we are wasting away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? The word of the Lord. Our second scripture lesson is from Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 6. Devote yourself to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mysteries of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversations be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Amen. Now I invite you to stand together, and we'll be bringing in the message with a hymn. Hallelujah. Amen. 
be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Good to be with you again this morning. I'll take just a brief moment to say thank you. Uh, on behalf of Vision Partners, if you do not know, uh, Vision Partners is a ministry to smaller churches and pastors, and as part of your missionary endeavor, you do support us, and you've done that recently, and so we are thankful for that, and so I just take a moment to say that and to say thank you. But today we're going to look at the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10. And uh, we'll just get started by reading the first 12 verses together. I believe it's on the screen, or you can look it up if you would prefer. Luke chapter 10, beginning with verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 72, some say 70, others, and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone along the way. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move from house to house. When you enter a house and are welcomed, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town that sticks to your feet we wipe off against you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God is near." I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Very interesting scripture. So, we're talking about prayer. Last Sunday you began, well, I think you began the series on prayer. <laughs> um, and today is the second Sunday as we walk our way uh, through to Pentecost, seeking to pray each day. And I have this prayer journal, and you might have this, this uh, also. You have the exact same thing out there, and you just have a nice white paper like this. But it's the prayer journal, and each day we're encouraged to, to read it and reflect on it. And of course, I encourage you to do that. The problem is prayer can be complicated. Or maybe I should say we make it complicated. Uh, we have a tendency to think of prayer as asking God for something. But of course that's a limited view of what prayer really is. A better understanding of prayer is having a conversation with God. We're talking to God, He's talking to us, we're talking, we're listening, He's listening, He's talking. And what we're seeking to do in this process of prayer, we're working through, well, what are we to do? What are we to not do? Uh, and in the case of maybe some specific things, you know, what, what should we even be asking for? The one thing we can be sure of, that God wants us to listen, and God wants us to ask. He wants us to ask. Now, sometimes we don't always get it right, do we? especially the first time we ask. But anyway, today's task, uh, today's text is, is really not complicated hardly at all because what we're asked to do is to pray for workers to enter the harvest field. So if you've read your prayer journal this morning, you know that, that this is the key text uh, in today's reading. And that's one of the reasons I chose it. The other reason was when I saw that it was today's text, I said, I want to preach that. <laughs> so, so it was great. So it's in our journal, and I know that many of you are using it. And if you're not already using it, uh, I encourage you to jump in. And so 
it says in the reading today that this is the only prayer request that Jesus uh, is that he makes that's recorded in Scripture. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. I, I really didn't take the time to check it all out. And it might sort of be a, 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 an interpretive kind of thing, but it's definitely, he directly and very specifically asks us, he asked the 70, and he asked us to pray for workers to enter into the harvest field. So there it is, very clear. Do we have to question what God wants us to pray for here? Not at all. It's crystal clear. He's saying, pray for workers to enter the harvest field. Now, if Jesus asks us to pray something, I think that's incredibly important, don't you? I mean, very specifically, if he asks, I think that's pretty important. Now, even though we know what to ask, we still may have some questions about, well, what exactly does that mean? What exactly are we asking God to do? And, and how do we cooperate with Him? Because we're supposed to be cooperating with God in, uh, through prayer and through our lives, aren't we? We all agree on that one? We are to cooperate with God? <laughs> I hope we do. All right, so I want to start by just suggesting or saying three things that this does not mean. Because I, I believe that sometimes that we in the church, we read this and, and we say, well, yeah, I'm going to pray that. And I'm going to, you don't have to agree with me. I'm going to suggest pretty strongly, though, there's three things it does not mean. And one thing that I don't believe it means, it, it is not a prayer that mature Christians will walk through your door and help you. And I think maybe that's the first thing a lot of us think of. <laughs> yes, Lord. We need workers. We pray for workers. Send them in. And we're kind of asking for God to give us workers here in our situation. I work with several churches and several pastors, and I've never heard one of them say, we have all the workers we need. <laughs> I've never heard it. Uh, what, what I've heard every time is we need more people who are willing to serve. That's what I hear all the time. And it's certainly exciting when followers of Jesus say, move into the community and, and visit your church and decide that this is the church. I think that's fantastic. I mean, I was a pastor. I know that's good. Uh, you, you love that when it happens. But I really don't think that that's what this particular prayer is about. Uh, secondly, I don't believe it's a prayer that God will raise somebody up to take my place, so I can just do nothing. Hmm? I don't think it's it. Now, I think it's a great prayer to pray that God will raise people up to do what I'm doing. In fact, I, I think it's a great thing when any, when any of us are helping somebody to learn how to do what we're doing, whether it's lead a Bible study or lead music, or, you know, help in different ways. Those are great things. But I don't think it's so great when we're saying, I just, I just want them to do it so I don't have to do it. That, I don't, I don't think, is, is what God is about. I, I've, in pastoral ministry, uh, I was in pastoral ministry over 40 years, and sometimes I heard an older saint say something like this, I've paid my dues. It's time for someone else to do that. Hope you have never said that. <laughs> well, do you think that's a biblical position? Or do you think it's even a saintly statement? Uh, well, I think there are times that we can legitimately step aside from ministry. So I don't want to give the wrong idea. I, I believe there are times, whether you're a pastor or whether you're a lay person, that you can sort of take a sabbatical. Say, you know what? I've been doing this particular thing a long time, and I need a month or two or three to just step aside from this so I can step back in and do it with greater effectiveness. I think there is a, a time for that. And of course, there are times in our lives because of health or other situations that we just have to step away from ministry. 
Those things can happen. But that's not what this prayer is about. This prayer isn't saying, Lord, raise up somebody else so I don't have to do anything. No, that, that's not a biblical spirit. It's not the spirit of Jesus, and it's not the spirit of a follower of Jesus. Well, the third thing I want to suggest, that this is not a prayer just for more pastors and missionaries or other full-time workers. Now, here's the problem, as I see it, with that kind of thinking. Since we are not pastors, and we probably don't want to be pastors. By the way, I'm in that club. I don't want to be a pastor anymore. <laughs> but, uh, it, you know, I don't know too many people, whether they're younger or older, just say, I want to be a pastor. Usually, the, the first thought of being a pastor is the same thought I had. No way, I don't want to do that. <laughs> That's usually the first thought. But I don't believe that we need to be praying about, well, this is just about God raising up more pastors. Here's the problem with that. If we pray that way, it, 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 it takes us off the hook. We don't have to worry about us anymore. We're, we're just praying about them. And I, I, don't, I don't believe that that's the spirit of this prayer. This, this prayer is actually a prayer that initially... Jesus is asking workers to pray for workers. So they're not off the hook. They're involved. So we need to be part of the solution. All right, enough of negative Nancy. Let's, uh, let's get on to some other stuff. Some positive observations about this prayer and, and about the text as a whole. First of all, those praying were willing to do what they were being asked to pray for. They were willing to do that. They were actually preparing to do for it. In a nutshell, they were the workers who were going to go do the work, and at the same time, they were going to be praying for workers. Several years ago, I wrote this in my prayer journal. Prayer is not a substitute for action, but preparation for action. I actually don't believe that anymore. Well, I sort of believe it, but I sort of don't believe it. Because here's what I believe now. Prayer is not a substitute for action. Prayer is the first action step. Now, there's not a lot of difference in those two statements, but it, it's kind of attitudinal to think. It, it's seeing prayer is the first action action step. Prayer's important. It's part of the action. But it's not replacement for the rest of the action. It's the first action step. So that's, that's how I see it now. Prayer is not a substitute for action, but the first action step. Prayer is the step that leads to the next step. Well, secondly, second observation is that those praying and going were no names. I find this interesting. I hadn't really thought about that too much, frankly. I don't know if I'd ever thought of it before uh, this last week as I was preparing for today. We don't know who these people were. Now, if you look at Luke 9, the, the 12 apostles were sent out to do a very similar thing that these 70 were sent out to do. Now, the 12 apostles, we know who they were, at least we know their names, you know, Peter and James and John and Matthew and Judas. There were a lot of, you know, we, we know all their names. We can look them up if we, I don't know all 12 right off the top of my head, but I know a lot of them, and we can look them up, and they've got names. We know who they are. And yet, you've heard enough sermons, I imagine, and you've heard it said many times that the 12 apostles were pretty ordinary people. They, they weren't the kind of people that most of the rabbis went looking for. They were fishermen and tax collectors and this and that. And they, they were not the typical people that a rabbi would gather around them. They were ordinary people. And I'm, I'm guessing these 12 were also ordinary people. Ordinary disciples responding to the call of Jesus. And of course, you know what I'm going to say next, don't you? Ordinary people just 
like us. Just like us. Third observation is that they, that there are receptive people out there to be reached. Jesus sent them out and he told them, you're going to find somebody who's going to open their home to you and be available to you. Interesting, huh? You're going to find somebody like that. Now, I think that's still true today. But there are many people, many people in the church, in the church of the United States, even in the church of the Nazarene, there are many people, I believe, doubt that. How, how, how often have you heard it said, and I hope you've not said it, but maybe you have, people just aren't interested anymore. I've heard it said a lot. So, my question is this, would Jesus ask you to pray for something that can't happen? I don't believe that. Jesus asked them to pray. He sent them out. He said, he basically said, there's going to be somebody. We don't know, you don't know who it is. And you might ask somebody. They might, they might not be a person of peace. They might not, uh, you offer peace. They might not offer peace back. They might not be interested. But somewhere, there's, there's going to be somebody who's interested. They're going to open your home, their home to you. Okay? It can happen. That's why Jesus asked us to pray. Because it's possible. So let me tell you a story from my youth. I grew up in the county. You all know what the, where the county is? Northern Maine? Huh? We don't even have towns up there. We're just the county. You know? There's hardly enough people in the whole county to have one town. <laughs> there's, a, there's a few more than in Portland, but not many. Uh, but anyway, I grew up there, and at, when I was up there, there were lots of potato farmers. Now, there's still potato farmers up there, but there's not very many of them. And, th and they're huge. When I was up there, when I was a kid, there were lots of farmers, and they were small farms. 100 acres or less, usually. So anyway, uh, in the spring, when I turned about 12, uh, I, I learned to cut potatoes into seed. You'd cut them into seed. And you make sure that there were eyes in each piece of the seed. Because that's, without the eyes, they can't, they can't grow, right? So I, I did that in the spring. And then around uh, age 16, I, I graduated uh, to working on the farm to help with the planting of the potatoes. So that was in the spring. So in the late summer, uh, the farmers uh, they'd been working all summer, cultivating and everything else, but in the late summer, they, they would make sure that they had baskets ready and barrels ready. The potato house was operational. The trucks and the tractors were running smoothly. And the digger, uh, that's the machine that kind of gets the potatoes out of the ground and shakes the dirt out and all that kind of stuff so that you can get at the potatoes. Uh, they'd make sure all that stuff was ready to go. And then they, there was a final step. They needed to hire people. They needed to hire people to drive the trucks and drive the tractors, to operate the digger, uh, to work on the back of the truck and in the potato house. And most importantly, they needed people to pick the potatoes. Now, do you think for one second that these farmers would have planted and cultivated and prepared all summer long if they didn't believe there was going to be somebody to pick the potatoes. They wouldn't have done it, would they? No, they believed they could find the workers. And here's, here's why they believed they could find the workers. They knew that all the schools up there in the county are going to totally shut down for three weeks. And they would make every possible available adult, teen, and child to go out in the fields and pick potatoes. I started when I was age five. Age five. 25 cents a barrel. And I earned over $80 that fall at five years old. I liked money, so I worked hard. 
of course, I was right beside my mother. My older brothers were there in the same field. So, so what's, what's the point? Why, why tell the story about my youth? You've probably heard about the county a lot of times, but uh, those farmers, Guy Todd and Mike, case, he, he hired people like my mother and my brothers and I uh, because they knew there was a harvest and they knew that if they didn't get it out of the ground, the potatoes were going to rot. And up in the county, if you don't get those potatoes out of the ground by the end of September, very early October, they're going to freeze. Then they'll rot. <laughs> they just won't be any good. So my conviction is that Jesus knows that there are people in every community who don't have a relationship with him, but they are receptive. And the problem is not that there are no receptive people. The problem is there's not enough workers to interact with the receptive people. So what do we do? Well, I've already suggested that what we need to do, the first action step is to pray for workers. And we need to pray with the kind of boldness that Pastor Tim talked about two weeks ago when he preached from Acts chapter 5. I listened to the message uh, because I wanted to kind of get a little bit of background. And uh, he prayed about how those, how those disciples just, they were bold. And, and they wouldn't stop. And they were praying that God would give them opportunities and they took some risks and they went after it. So that's a first step. Now we've already begun to move from observation to kind of application there. But here's a fourth that's both an observation and an application, I guess. These, these workers were preparing the way for Jesus. That's why they were sent out there. Jesus was going to go to these villages. Now, Jesus doesn't have to go to one village at a time anymore. By his spirit, I mean, he... He can just go all over the world, all at the same time, everywhere. Uh, but I believe that's really our task. Our task is, is to prepare, prepare people for Jesus. Our lives, our words, our actions are to prepare people to re be receptive to Jesus. The Colossians text, if you want to go back and look at that later, talks about that, you know, and that we're to pray and that, that we're, in all of our conversation, we're, our conversations to be with grace. And we're to be gracious people in relating to others. And our, the 70 that went out, they went out two by two and they would go to a place and then they would go to one home. And you notice that they were told to stay in that one home. Why do you think? I think they were to stay there so they could build relationships with that one family, so that they go deeper with that one family, so that they could disciple that one family. And they could have just bounced from house to house, had superficial conversations. They could have even maybe bounced to house to house and be thought of as kind of celebrities in the community, got a really super nice meal every day. <laughs> But they stayed in the one house, and maybe for two or three days they'd kind of be treated special. But after that, guess what? That you get over that pretty fast, and just, you're just living life. And I believe that's what they did. Now, in, in case you're wondering, I'm not suggesting you go to somebody's house and ask them if you could live with them. That's not my point. My point is, you develop relationships. And you're looking for some people that are willing to go a little deeper. And of course, you've got to be willing, too. Fifth observation is that they didn't, they didn't fly solo. They went out two by two. I want to clarify something that I believe right here, and I'm interpreting, so I admit it. You don't have to agree with this. But here's, here's what I believe. I believe that praying for workers is the same thing as praying for disciples. And that praying for disciples is the same thing as praying for for workers, because disciples, in my mind, are followers of Jesus, and part of that is 
that they're going to be involved in the mission of Jesus. You can reflect on that for a while if you want. Right now you can pay attention to me. Reflect on that a little later. <laughs> but, but you think about that. Now, probably you, you've heard people say, and maybe you've said it too, I don't know how to make disciples. Well, uh, Jesus didn't ask them to go by themselves, and I don't think they knew everything, but what they had was each other, and one of the things we have to remember is that we have each other. So I'd like to make a suggestion. If, if you're one of those people that say, I don't know how to make a disciple, first of all, you probably know a ton more than you think you know, but if you thought that way, here's a suggestion. Prayerfully, find a person who, like you, wants to make disciples, sort of feels inadequate, and begin to disciple each other. Begin to purposely work with each other to grow in faith, to pray together, to understand the word, to maybe do some things that you might think, well, these are the things I would do with somebody if I was helping them to grow in Christ, or to find Christ or grow in Christ. And your, your, your pastor will coach you, won't you, Tim, if you're online right now? Uh, he, he'll coach you if, you if you ask him. He'll, he'll give you some ideas and some thoughts. And as you gain confidence, God will lead you how to move forward together. I don't, I don't think God wants any of us to go out there solo. I feel like we've got to do it on our own. That, I don't believe anywhere in Scripture that's the way it works. So, the fear that so many of us feel when someone suggests, well, you can disciple someone, you can help somebody along in their faith or help somebody who's interested, they're not yet a believer, but you can help them along so they understand. The fear that comes with us, I really think it's from the enemy. And that fear of the enemy is, is a fear that stops us from taking the next step. We might pray, but we don't take the next step. And prayer is the first action step. It's not the final action step. So, let's go back to Potato Fields of the County for a moment. And I've sort of already implied this, but what would be the point to plant p potatoes and cultivate them and prepare all the trucks and the tractors and the diggers and the barrels and the baskets and the potato houses and not pick the potatoes? Wouldn't be any point at all, would there? No point at all. So, we too, we need to find ways to enter the harvest field. And we, as we work that through together, whether it's just you and a friend or in the church community or whatever, we just need to find a way. I'll give two specific suggestions related to prayer, related to the specific prayer that we are to pray for workers to enter into the harvest field. Many people are setting their cell phone alarms to 10.02 in the morning or the evening or both so that it'll go off every day at that time. And when it goes off, it just reminds them to pray for workers. So that's a simple thing that thousands, if not millions of people are doing around the world. They're just setting their phones uh, to 10.02 and they're praying for workers when it goes off. So that's, that's something you might want to try. I think some people, it drives them crazy. <laughs> some people, they can't do it because of their work environment. But again, many, many people around the world are doing this. Something you might want to consider. The second thing <clears throat> that you might uh, do is commit yourself to extraordinary prayer. Now, when I said that, some of you just said, oh, no in your spirit. <laughs> He's dropping the bombshell now. Extraordinary prayer. Well, that's a, that's a phrase I picked up from uh, the disciple-making movement. And 
I, I'm not asking you to do anything crazy, actually. Extraordinary prayer simply means I'm praying more now than I was. That's all it means. So, for example, if you're not praying at 10.02 each day for workers, and you were to start to do that, for you, that would be extraordinary prayer. Because you're doing more. Now, if you keep doing that, it becomes a habit three or four or five or six months down the road. It's not extraordinary anymore. It's just part of your, part of your rhythms. It's part of your lifestyle, right? And then you might have to think again, okay, well, what would that mean? Maybe you're a person that, you, know, you, you might be a person that prays a lot, but let's just say you pray five or ten minutes each morning. Or maybe you pray five or ten minutes each evening. Or maybe you do both. Well, extraordinary prayer for you might be adding five minutes might be adding an aspect to prayer that you don't pray now. Maybe you pray for workers all the time, but you don't praise very much, or you're not giving thanks very much, or whatever. But extraordinary prayer is just simply, if, you know, if, I'm, if I'm reading the Word and praying, say, 10 minutes a day, well, what if I made it 15? After a while, that would become a habit. wouldn't be extraordinary anymore. But the idea here is you're just adding an element of prayer to your life to help you connect with God, and to be praying for those workers that God's asked us to work for. So, here's my wrap-up. Here at Cape Elizabeth, you're on a journey, a journey of prayer through Pentecost Sunday. Now, several ideas are going to come to you as you read each day. Some of them are probably just going to be reminders. And some of them might be new. So those ideas are going to be placed before you. Now, if you pick up on a couple of them and begin to put them into your life, you've just done extraordinary prayer. <laughs> See, it's, it's not that hard. So I'm going to invite the Holy Spirit to impress you with how to go deeper in your conversations with God, how prayer can be your first action step, and how to prioritize prayer for workers. That's my encouragement. Pretty simple. I pray you'll do it. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to move into prayer. And we're going to ask God to help us on this journey. So let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you that you have invited us to come to you and to spend time with you and to invite you to speak into our lives and to just bring before you our concerns and our issues. So, Lord, we just take a moment to give thanks for the privilege of being your children, for the privilege of having a relationship with you, for the privilege of having a church community, the privilege of joining this community, whether we come within the four walls of this building or whether we come online. We thank you for all that you give to us, all the blessings, all the things that you are teaching us and helping us to understand and know and do. We praise you, Lord, that you're the God of love and grace and goodness, that you offer forgiveness to all, and that in your love and goodness and kindness, you reach out to us before we ever reach out to you. We praise you for this and so much more. 
we ask God for the ability to develop positive habits, positive rhythms of spending time with you. And we pray, Lord, that you would raise up workers for the harvest field. We pray, Lord, that, of course, we would be willing to be workers in whatever way you show us. And we pray, Lord, that you would raise up those that we don't even know yet, haven't even met yet, who will enter into your field. And, and we pray, Lord, for those individuals, those families, those homes that you have prepared. They're receptive. And we pray, God, that we or, or some other worker would come into relationship with them and they would come into relationship with you. Help us all to grow and develop together. We pray, Lord, for the situations around the world that are very difficult. And of course, Ukraine comes to us uh, probably first when we think about this. But we ask, Lord, there are many, many situations in our world where there's struggle, where there's hunger, where there's uh, refugees, where there are, are people that are struggling. There are people in, in our own neighborhoods and around us that are struggling with, with lack of, of resources, with food deprivation, with, with uh, the inability to somehow land a job or maybe to keep a job, those struggling maybe with addictions, etc. We pray, God, your touch upon them. We pray, God, you would use us where you would have us uh, to be involved. We know we can't do it all. We can't do it all as individuals, and we can't do it all as a church, but we pray, Lord, that we would do what you call us to do. So, Lord, thank you again for this opportunity to be together today. We give this time, or we thank you for this time, and we ask that as we go through the balance of this day and this week and this month and this year, that we would be yielded to you in every aspect of life. And now we ask that you would help us as we pray together the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. This is the time in our service where we are privileged to take the time to remember what the Lord Jesus has done for us and to also reflect on the fact that we have a great future before us. So Jesus, in the night of the Passover, he gathered together with his disciples to hold the Passover meal, except he gave it a new meaning, a meaning based or rooted in who he is and what he would do. We are reminded that in the same night that our Lord was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. 
do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So Lord, we ask that you would help us come before you now. Come before you with humility and come before you in faith, believing that as we partake of this holy sacrament, that Lord, we, in receiving, we are saying, we receive you. In receiving, we are saying, we are putting our faith and our trust in you. In receiving, we are saying, we desire to follow you. We desire to be more and more like you, Jesus. We desire to be your people. So help us, God. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to invite you at this time to stand and to come and receive the bread and the cup. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was broken for you. Take, eat, and be thankful. blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you, shed for all of us, that we might know the forgiveness of sin. Take, drink, and rejoice. <coughs> Amen. Well, let's stand together, and let's sing, and rejoice.
May we go in the joy of that story. May we live out that story. And may we share that story. Guide us, we pray. Go in his peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.